Um, we started this lecture series about, I think, four semesters. This is a fifth semester now. We're doing it together. Christoph is from criminal law and I'm from the public and constitutional law department. And we link in our interest in to see what algorithms do with society and the state, state actions, state decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, fortunately, Contrast, our research initiative, started uh, pretty much at the same time. So they were generous to allow us basically to run under their flag and get interesting people triggered by saying that people um, like Guido Friebel or Vincent Hediger will listen to. And um, we have been dealing with different concepts here. So now we're looking into the brave new world uh, aspects, but we've been looking at control, at uncertainty, at uh, the deviation of power or the distribution of power so far. And we have had numerous speakers from everywhere uh, in the world, basically. I think um, it's a premiere for this season that we have someone from Australia. And this will be a session a little bit later because that colleague of ours is going to get up very early so that we can have a late evening talk. But um, that's basically the story behind this that we are trying to enlarge basically the legal perspective with an interdisciplinary look at what algorithms can do, what it does with actors, with institutions, with normative orders um, and the whole set. And I see that Vincent has come and has left the swimming pool area. So I pass the word on if I haven't forgotten anything, Christoph. Mm. Yes, uh, hi, um, I'm, I'm sorry for the, the delay very dense schedule. Um, I would just like to welcome you in the name of CONTRAST, uh, the interdisciplinary research uh, project on the dynamics of uh, trust and conflict, which we've been working on uh, for going on two years now. And one of the one of the uh, backbones of our activity has actually been this lecture series. Uh, many of us have had the honor to participate in this, and it's truly an interdisciplinary enterprise that exemplifies, I think, the kind of um, interdisciplinary thinking about core issues um, that uh, we want to um, establish and, and uh, build uh, at contrast. And it's, of course, about a topic that is of uh, central concern to us, um, new forms of uh, algorithmic trust, algorithmic exchange, um, uh, political organization uh, that takes different forms now that that is now increasingly based in in digital formats and digital networks. Uh, those are some of the challenges that that we are trying to address in our research. So thanks again in the name of the the project Sprecher Leadership to uh, Indra and and uh, Christoph for continuing the series and thanks to all the speakers for accepting the invitations and I'm very much looking forward uh, to tonight's talk and discussion. Thank you. It's it's a true pleasure, Jillian, to welcome you to this uh, to this event. Uh, um, so the I'm really glad that I have several screens because I will just open them now and, uh, and present you uh, from from what I from what I have of course you looked uh, at uh, at your web page, but I will uh, will also uh, uh, recount a little bit of what I read before. So um, Jillian Hetfield is the Schwartz Reisman Chair in Technology and Society um, and a Professor of Law and Strategic Management and the Director of the Schwartz, I think the inaugural Director uh, of the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Te Technology and Society at the University of Toronto. Um, so one of the most um, esteemed and established um, research institutions uh, in the, the new world. Um, Jillian is, I think, wonderfully combining um, these topics of law and economics. Um, she has uh, worked extensively on that. And the, the interesting, um, I think, subject matter for us is how she squares um, how technology and society interacts and how technology is basically uh, a techno societal uh, system where, uh, where both I guess, uh, interact in ways um, that technology shapes society and is at the same uh, um, same time shaped by society. Um, she has uh, not only taught contracts, um, this is Guido now calling me, but I'll just uh, um, remove him as <laughs> I'm improvising. And um, she's also, uh, she's also um, 
Okay. Uh, she's also uh, worked on problems of legal design and and uh, issues like responsible AI. She has published extensively um, on this on on if you will all the in in all the important uh, in all the important uh, editorial houses there are Oxford University Press, um, etc. And today she will um, give us a talk, maybe for at, at first instance rather technically sounding, but um, all the more so uh, very important um, on on. Uh, where is your um, one second? I've opened the near on um, how uh, we judge norms um, in in um, in in the squaring of technology in society, and how tr tr training machine learning models um, to judge human uh, humans require a neutral approach to labeling data. Um, so. The the uh, again intersection of uh, a technological, if you will, look on the underlying systems and mechanics um, of machine learning and how that impacts um, how we maybe determine the the next steps, the next evolution of question mark of um, well judging norms um, or judging uh, something that so far was a very law and very human thing. And we'll see how this will then be established in the future once technology, AI, machine learning um, gets into the picture. So um, of course, Guido would have done this far more eloquently and with more knowledge. Um, uh, and I'm all the more so very interested and very much looking forward to your talk, Jill. Right. Thank, thanks, Christoph, and, and I'm really um, looking forward to this discussion with, with such a, a diverse and interdisciplinary crowd. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, and hopefully everybody can see that. All well, good. Um, so I, I just as a, as, a, as a little bit of overview, what I've been doing for the last four or five years, um, while I've been working in this area overlapping between law, economics, and, um, and artificial intelligence for probably about six or seven years and running the Institute for the last four. Um, and I think it's actually one of the key, the reason I'm quite excited to talk to everybody is um, that you know the, the the developments in these technologies are moving at an incredible pace, um, and one of the things that I've seen is that you know it's it's, it's attracting lots and lots of attention from uh, researchers in uh, in computer science and engineering, um, and not yet, in my view, enough from our social scientists, uh, economics, legal scholars, political scientists sociologists and, and so on. Um, and yet I think what we're seeing is, is a pretty significant redrawing of the way the world works. Uh, and law in particular, I think, has a central role to play. And that's part of what uh, I'll be talking about today. Um, so the project I'm going to talk to you about is uh, joint work with this uh, wonderful gallery of of uh, students and, and uh, professors, um, a mix of folks at U of T and at MIT. Um, and uh, this is part of my acquiring of the, uh, the practice in computer science to, to always show the photographs. I think that's nice of, of who you're working with. So this, these are my co-authors. So you, you're, you may be aware that automated decision systems have already made their way into a number of uh, private sector areas. So you may have been hearing about uh, credit markets uh, using, you know, banks using automated decision systems to decide who gets a loan or schools, uh, universities and schools using um, automated decision systems to, um, uh, just, you know, review resume uh, to decide who gets admitted into programs, employers using it to decide who gets an interview, what resumes uh, who, who we hire. And of course, the, the European Union was one of the first uh, globally to uh, sort of plant a flag for legal regulation around automated decision systems quite early on, really, in the general data protection regulation, uh, amongst other things around privacy and data handling. 
establishing that data subjects have a right to um, um, to not be subject to a decision solely based on automated processing. And where there was automated processing to get a um, uh, what came to be called a right to explanation about how the automated decision system had operated. Um, formally, it, it talked about gaining meaningful information about the logic involved. And when I look at the GDPR, and again, this feels like you know ancient history now, 2018, coming into effect in, in this domain, things move so fast. Um, you know, this is where I sort of see the, the fingerprints of, of lawyers and the legal sector uh, trying to get their, their heads around this and saying, well, if we have database systems that are making decisions, then as when we have humans making those decisions, there needs to be some capacity to challenge the decision. And this got rep reflected as a right to explanation, but I think that's not quite right. I think it's thinking, uh, we, we, what it's really aiming at is um, the thing that we pay a lot of attention to in law, which is our decisions being made in accordance with the rules governing how decisions are supposed to be made. Um, I call this justification rather than explanation. And that puts on uh, onto the table thinking about what do we, what is it we're really looking for with automated decisions in order for them to be accepted, lawful, um, consistent with human expectations, social expectations, and so on. And so that's, that's part of what's driving this project. Now, we're also seeing automated decision systems emerging in the public sector, um, you know, being used at borders to make uh, immigration decisions, being used, for example, to decide benefits. You may be aware of uh, the Dutch government that got into a lot of trouble. The whole government had to resign around the use of an automated decision system that was used to detect fraud in uh, a benefit uh, system. And we're seeing it in the tax area. And we're starting to see it emerge in the context of direct reg adjudication of rules and regulation. This is uh, from a, a study done by researchers mostly at Stanford. Um, you know, just a, a, in some ways, just a convenient sample of the use of where, where they saw the use of automated decisions algorithms in government. This is, and this is now also feeling like 22 years ago, it's ancient history um, already. Um, but at the time, they were finding significant uses, examples of use in law enforcement and health, financial regulation, the environment, um, communications, and so on. And, and interestingly, that the largest number of cases that they found um, were in uh, legal domains like Office of Justice programs um, and uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, a regulatory agency. A lot of the use of those algorithms was for research and monitoring, um, but some was emerging. Um, sorry, I somebody's got a. Uh, thank you, um, but but some emerging in enforcement and adjudication. Um, so I think the question this raises for us is is fundamentally how should we train how should we train machines to make normative judgments, that is to apply our rules and regulations, our normative assessments. Um, and uh, what I wanna do here is talk a little bit about how we train machine learning systems um, uh, in the conventional cases, in the standard cases. And the paradigmatic case here is machine, is image recognition. I'll, um, I'll go over this a little bit for people who don't have um, a lot of background. In, uh, in machine learning, but the, the paradigmatic case is image recognition where the goal of the training of the machine learning model is to correctly identify an image to match what's called the ground truth, a descriptive and a factual claim. So here's a, a depiction of a, um, of a uh, uh, neural network, a schematic of a neural network on the left, you're giving the machine, you're giving the, the, the computer uh, images and uh, the machine is um, through a set of computations, these are those nodes represent sort of a computation being passed on to the next layer. Um, um, and uh, the machine starts out just guessing. Um, uh, so, you know, it starts out randomly guessing that this is a, the correct label for this image is a dog. 
It then gets feedback that gets fed back to the, uh, the, the earlier layers, fed, fed back through the network to say, nope, that was a mistake. It makes an adjustment in the computations to try and get it, get it right, ultimately getting to the correct one. And the, what the machine is trying to do is match the labels to those images that have been supplied by lots and lots of humans. So we have labeled data sets that are used to train those machine learning models. So we have something, for example, one of the earliest ones, the CIFAR-10 data set, a collection of images that have been labeled, airplane, automobile, dog, frog, et cetera. Those are the data sets against which these machine models are being trained. Um, uh, we have one called the Celeb A data set, um, celebrity faces because they're considered to be fairly public domain out there on the internet when they're being scraped but used to uh, then labeled with things like, this is a person wearing a hat, these are eyeglasses, this person has bangs, this person has a mustache, and then training the model to recognize that. And what you wanna do when you train that model is to be able to then provide an accurate label for an image the model wasn't trained on, something outside the training data set. Other examples of training data sets, uh, like the IMDB data, data set um, that, you know, takes in snippets of reviews that are written of movies and then lab ha attaches labels. Again, humans attaching those labels. This is a positive review. This is a negative review. Um, there's another one, the ESNLI data set, uh, data set from, from Stanford, which takes in bits of, of language and labels it as um, it would sort of logical. Is this, is, is the first one, the premise, um, a is a uh, an entailment of the uh, an implication of the second one is it neutral does it contradict so trying to train a machine to recognize when text contains entailments or contradictions or neutral statements and I want to really emphasize this is a massive human industry to label all of these data sets. Um, but uh, at the same time, even though it's a large industry to label the data sets to train a lot of the machine learning that you're interacting with online, for example, or on your devices, um, most data sets do not have a lot of labelers for each of those elements. So um, the IMDB one, the movie database that I just mentioned, um, only has one labeler per item. So you can't address the point that some people might think that's a positive review and some people might think it's a negative review. And only a handful have as many as 10 uh, labelers. So the question that we face focus on, so there's training machines, or training machines to match human assessments. And, and now we wanted to say, so now the lot, the, what I just showed you was uh, descriptive judgment. Is this person wearing eyeglasses in this picture? Um, and now I want to say, okay, so what happens when we start training machines to make normative judgments? Now, the how is in parentheses here to say, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this at all. Believe me, as I was just trying to emphasize, it's moving uh, ahead at tremendous pace. So as a, from an economist's point of view, this is a general purpose technology. We live in decentralized environments. Um, these uses of machine learning are, are, are definitely being uh, built. So we want to think about, so, so what are the examples of how we are doing this? Um, well, what does it mean to make a, a normative judgment? It means to apply a rule of this type. If these conditions, these factual predicates are met, then apply this uh, normative judgment. Um, so what's happening is, is uh, people who are training these, these systems are collecting factual labels. Uh, they are predicting the presence of those factual labels, and then they are computing the judgment from the prediction of the factual labels. It seems like quite a natural and normal thing to do. There's not a lot of, it's very difficult to get access to uh, public domain examples of how this training is happening, partly because things are very badly documented, and also because most of it's happening inside private technology companies, so we don't have the visibility. That's another set of issues um, to think through. But we can find examples online of content moderation being done in this way, label the com comments as toxic or not, and then apply the rules about the use of toxic comments, detect factual features in exam uh, supervision to see whether or not a student is looking at a book and then apply our rules or um, to assess dress codes, detect features um, of clothing that are 
um, in your dress code. And we're gonna see more examples of that. You may have heard about the Compass uh, machine learning system in the U US being used for recidivism risk prediction in the criminal domain. Um, and of course, this is a case where there are there is a normative judgment being made in a bail setting, for example, like the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom says that anybody charged with an offense has the right uh, to bail um, unless there is just cause and just cause is based on, among other things, a factual predicate about whether or not there is uh, a likelihood of, of re-offense. So when the compass system gets gets built, it's built to predict, uh, accurate, to develop accurate prediction of those facts. It's trained um, to predict those factual labels, but then it's being used in, in courts to make normative judgments. So these are examples of how we're seeing this um, used. So we set out to study the question um, of whether or not if an automated decision system is trained on labels corrected from one set of humans, could another set of humans recover the reasons that justify the outcomes? That was our original research question because we wanted to know if we could develop a scheme, like a licensing scheme, to say you can't use a machine learning model to judge humans unless it can be justified by humans or asked later. So a little bit like being able to call to the, to the witness box someone in a legal proceeding to defend the decision that's been made, sort of our basic structure of our legal system. And then we got really surprised when we started this research. We gave some examples, we did some pilot testing. And what we found is if we gave, we decided to work on a, a dress code kind of environment because you can find lots of pre-labeled data sets on the internet that have taken lots of pictures of people in clothing and already attached human labels to that. And that's an expensive process. So we thought, great, we've got these labeled data sets. Let's use those for our study. And we, uh, we found something, the, the surprising thing is we asked people, is there high skin exposure? For example, suppose that we have a dress code that says you can't wear clothing with uh, high skin exposure to the office or to school. So we asked people, is there high skin exposure? And um, we found, for example, like for this image in our small sample that 15 out of 20 said, yes, there's high skin exposure in that outfit. But when we then asked people sort of saying, okay, now we've got a labeled a uh, case of a violation of the outfit um, and a dress code. Does this outfit violate a dress code that prohibits high skin exposure? And we found that only seven out of 20 people said yes. So we were we had to go back to the drawing board because our project wasn't going to work because it couldn't take these pre-labeled data sets and now do this normative recovery of reasons because people didn't agree in these different settings. And so we set out to study that with a human subject um, experiment uh, in which we constructed what we called a normative, a, a descriptive condition where we just asked about the descriptive elements of clothing. So this is like a labeling exercise. This is how labels are collected on Mechanical Turk and other platforms, for example, um, identify clothing attributes um, and say whether or not this outfit has high skin exposure, contains texture graphics, has got short shorts or a short skirt. This is our made up uh, elements for a dress code. And then in our normative condition, we'd ask directly about, here's our dress code. Does this, does this outfit violate it? Logically, we think these should have the same answer. And what we've discovered is that they don't. We did this with four different contexts. We did it with clothing, as I just mentioned. We did it with a meal policy, sort of imagining that a school might have a rule, have rules about meals for, uh, for children. Um, we did it with a, uh, sort of a made up code about what kinds of pets you could have living with you in your apartment building. And we did it with a, a setting with text with comment with sort of guidelines from a forum about what kinds of uh, just uh, comments you could have. And we uh, collected 20 labels per image uh, in each condition. So notice this is already many more than we see in the labeled data sets being used. We had 2000 samples per data set. Um, and we apply to judge, if we collected labels in the descriptive condition, um, we applied the label um, uh, based on what facts did they predict, and then we just use that if-then logic to get to whether or not to attach a label, a judgment of violation or not. And we call the judgment label, label the percentage of labelers generating a violation judgment. What we discovered is that our judgment labels 
differ significantly uh, under normative and descriptive conditions. So for example, in uh, the difference in raw numbers looks kind of small on the clothing, in descriptive there's 48% that are uh, judged as a violation um, versus the normative 47.8. In the meal condition, we see uh, significantly more, 86 versus 59. Um, in the pet and the comment, we also see higher percentages that are judged as violations under the descriptive versus the normative conditions. And one of the things we started paying attention to as we went through is the percentage of contentious images in uh, the, the, the data set. So we, you know, just heuristically described as contentious uh, uh, an image where we had greater than 20% interlabeler disagreement in the descriptive condition, um, sort of anticipating that our differences between the descriptive and normative is more likely to show up with contentious images rather than uh, uncontentious images. And then uh, we went, we took a look at uh, sort of significant, uh, significant differences. And in this um, uh, graph here, show you the percentage of examples in our selected data set where there were significantly different violation judgments between conditions. Um, you can, and the, the bar to the left is the uh, overall, uh, the bar in the middle is the contentious and the bar to the right is the uncontentious. So you can see that in the contentious images, um, we have anywhere between say 18% in clothing up to over 60% in our meal data set um, where we get significantly different judgments um, in those different conditions. So you wanna think about this as if you took your um, your your judgment context, so you maybe you're judging um, uh, meals that whether or not they violate the policy, and you took it away from a human making that judgment to a machine learning system that you trained on descriptive data, you would have a higher rate of violations being found than if you handed it to humans or if you handed it to a system that was trained on normative judgment. Um, which probably would make people unhappy um, that they were having their case decided by um, uh, the machine because they were more likely to be found to be in violation if it's trained on that descriptive. We looked at whether or not, our, we, we started off in this, what I just showed you was with a threshold rule that said we called it a violation at 50%, uh, called it a violation or found the, the factual predicates for a violation. Uh, we looked at what happens if we vary that threshold, you know, is it just one person says it's a violation versus you have to have almost everybody. And we still see the, the vertical axis here is the percent of examples with different labels. And we still get a lot of variety here. Guido. Yes, so I'm I'm very happy to be back and 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 so sorry I couldn't uh, you know say all the nice things about you, uh, but I'm sure Christoph did a great job. So um, I find that really fascinating. I'm I'm just wondering to what extent this is a, um, a a problem that is inherent in machine learning, rather than saying that there's an uh, imperfect mapping between um, a descriptive state and a normative implication, which could be uh, equally present between uh, if, if you replace the machine learning by a judge, uh, judges could interpret the legal norms in different ways. And uh, because there's no such thing as a law that gives you the perfect mapping between something that is descriptive, descriptively A or A prime, where A is guilty and A prime is uh, not guilty. Could you briefly comment on this? Guido, Guido, may I just very quickly interrupt? Um, because what we usually typically do is that we let our speaker just go through their slides all at once, and then we do the discussion around. Would it be okay if you just keep that remark in mind and you'll get the first Absolutely. question to ask Jillian? Is that okay? I'm 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 happy to uh, to comply with the rules of the sequence. <laughs> I just ask in the beginning whether Jillian Jillian would be okay with uh, these kind of questions. I will ask it again. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, Thank so you I, very much. I, 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 the, the the comment I'll make is that um, this is as you saw in the 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 
examples of codes that we have, there are matters that are subjective, that with factual conditions that are subjectively assessed. Is this a short short, shorts or a short skirt, right? Um, uh, is, is this, you know, high in sugar as a meal? Those are, those are subjective factual discrepancies. But what we, what we're finding is that that, that, sh if that's the, if that's what's driving this difference, it should translate over that you've got the same, same percentage calling it, you know, calling it one way or the other. If you have a large enough sample, you should have still, oh, 40% of people think that's short, short. So 40% of people should think that that's a violation when you ask them. And so that, and that doesn't explain our results. Um, and let me just, um, uh, you know, it, it keep on here. We can come back to this in the discussion. Um, sorry, I'm just having to move my bar around here because it's filling up a lot of my screen. Um, so, um, you know, what one of the the uh, thoughts we had as we were trying to understand what what else might be explaining this result was that maybe it was just that there was context. Like when we ask people, are these short shorts? They don't know. Are you asking like for you know what you might wear to the club, or are you asking for what you would wear to work. So we we tried the descriptive uh, condition as well uh, in a version which we gave people more context. And we say, okay, determine whether the clothing below could be worn in an office or school setting by determining if it has these uh, characteristics. Or what we're interested in here is whether meals are healthy and wholesome, um, whether text is uh, respectful, um, whether a dog would be out of place in a small living space so that we, we gave people the context that the, the normative condition implicitly gives already. And we asked if we just asked the descriptive question with that context. And um, we found that that did not uh, eliminate the difference. Uh, in some cases, we actually got a larger difference uh, when we added in context. So you can see here in the clothing, um, people were even once you once you said, oh, it's the you know the school setting. They were even more likely to say that it was a violation, um, and and we got a bigger difference with our normative question. So it wasn't just a matter of of context. Um, and this this uh, graph shows you this in in a little bit more detail. This is showing you the percentage of objects with significantly different violation judgments on the left uh, between the normative and descriptive and on the right with the normative versus descriptive with context. So you can see we still have a significant fraction of the images in our samples that would, would generate different judgments based on whether you did it with the descriptive or normative question. So then we did, we did, this is just our human subjects experiment collecting the data on how do people judge these things descriptively versus normatively. We then said what happens if we train machine learning models on these different labels and assess the accuracy of the model against the normative judgment saying what we're trying to do here. And in the paper, we talk about the fact this itself is something we could, we could discuss, right? What is the goal? Maybe that is the goal to match normative judgments or is it to hew more strictly to no 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 you can't know that you're you're not being asked to judge normatively we just want you to judge the fact um so we 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 assess the accuracy against okay somebody would like to be judged with the same outcome as if there uh, had been a human in place um and what we did was we looked at um a variety of uh, char characteristics of our trained models um uh, to compare this, and the 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 red asterisks here represent uh, significant uh, cases with significant difference. So in the first in the first panel here, we just got the accuracy, which is the percentage of times that our um, uh, model predicts the the same label that we uh, the, the normative the label we'd get in the normative condition. Uh, and we see the, the the bars on the left are the models trained on descriptive labels, and the models on the bars on the right are the models trained on normative labels. Um, and you can see that we get a significant difference in accuracy across all our four contexts. Um, we look at a statistic that computer scientists in these contexts, uh, the supervised learning context, look at called F1, which is uh, an average of precision and recall. And we see significant difference in three out of our four cases there. Looked at differences in false positive rates and false negative rates. You can see that we get significant differences in a number of those. Um, 
And one of the things we also looked at is how this affects. So what, what's the impact of training on descriptive, using descriptive labels for a normative task versus the kinds of changes that computer scientists spend a lot of time playing with to improve the performance of their models, such as reducing noise in the labels um, um, and uh, you know, through, through different sampling techniques or using um, more powerful models. And what we found is probably easiest to look at the one, the, 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 the panel at the bottom here. The, the panels, uh, the bars on the left are showing what happens, your improvement in accuracy when you use better data, which is what we're saying you get if you go to descriptive labels. And the models on the, the right is the increase in accuracy you get using more powerful models, better models. So you can see that, that we're getting, um, particularly on the contentious uh, examples, which are the ones where you expect differences, the, the solid bar, uh, we're getting a higher effect from improving the data. And this is partly just a way of saying, so if engineers, you're spending a lot of time trying to write better models. You know, you could do a better job of improving accuracy by uh, improving the labels that you're using. So um, the, this is my last slide. So just to summarize, in, so we can have a conversation about what the implications of this are. Um, there's lots of things to discuss here, um, but you know, for example, um, if the goal is reproducing human judgment, uh, this is saying we should be training and evaluating on normative labels. And um, again, we, we don't have good visibility into all these practices. Uh, but the little bits we can see and the casual knowledge of what's happening in the industry um, says um, we're not using those normative labels. Note that normative labels are much more expensive to collect than descriptive labels. Uh, the reason we started out on the dress code was, hey, look at all these pre-labeled data sets that are out there because um, catalogs want them and online retailers want them. And we could just use those labels that that tell you what the characteristics of the clothing are and put them into this normative context. Um, so it's saying we should be collecting those normative labels, which is um, more expensive, and that we need to um, pay a lot more attention to documenting our data labeling practice and our test set choices. Um, we've had a lot of attention to the, the, the limitations and the, the lack of appropriate documentation practices in training when we're thinking about the fairness challenges to algorithms. Um, but this is saying that there's actually, you know, that we, we really should be paying a lot of attention to this if we're now going to take it. Because I think it's, uh, the reason I started off with us being surprised was say it's a very natural assumption to make that if you predict the factual predicates for your rule and then just apply your rule, you should be reproducing human judgment. And what we think we've identified is maybe this is going to Guido's question to begin with, that in fact, humans are making, are doing a different kind of cognitive processing when they are judging factual elements versus when they are judging another human being as having violated a rule or not. You could think of that in terms of, for example, different weights on um, false uh, positives for a violation. And saying, well, if I get it wrong, when I'm just trying to judge factually what's in this picture, I weight the false positive and the false negative the same. But if I'm gonna judge somebody, right, then I'm gonna put, um, uh, I'm gonna put, you know, a higher cost to a false positive than to a false negative. We can think of ways in which in law we say, we want a higher standard, right? you know, better that, what is the standard? Better that 10 people go free than, um, uh, 10 guilty people go free than that one innocent person be convicted. Um, so um, why don't I uh, stop my share so we can see each other and uh, hopefully we have some good time left for a conversation. Gillian, thank you very much. A very impressive and uh, a work which is rarely seen that a lawyer is doing empirical work and even doing machine learning by herself. Very, very impressive. Thank you. Well, no, I have, I have all those co-authors at the beginning. They're, <laughs> they're doing the training of the machines. So I'll, I'll best to that. Mm. But very convincing that you know what they have been doing, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>